Coming up on this edition of Airborne, the flying car is to be seen in the air at Oshkosh. Unique International is going green in a big way, and a NASA thruster that could take us into deep space. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. Well, if you weren't excited about Oshkosh before, you should be now as it's likely the first time many in the aviation world will actually get to see a flying car fly. Terra Fugia will be returning to EAA Air Venture in Oshkosh, Wisconsin this July 29th through August 4th. Terra Fugia's transition will be making its first air show appearance as part of the world's greatest aviation celebration. The transition is scheduled to perform immediately prior to the night air show, with wheels up at 8 p.m. Wednesday, July 31st. The 20-minute pre-sunset demonstration will feature conversion from driving to flying and back again, a flight demonstration as well as a driving pass in front of the crowd. Greenwing International has been announced as the producer of the E-Spider, an E-430 unique-powered electric aircraft. Unique International, which first displayed its electric-powered aircraft at AirVenture back in 2009, has been advancing its electric propulsion technologies ever since. Unique is rapidly becoming a well-known name in circles following the development of electric-powered aircraft. With the formation of GWI, Unique, which is based just north of Shanghai, will continue to focus on developing the most advanced and most reliable technologies for electric motors and power systems. Greenwing International will be bringing several e-spider aircraft to AirVenture 2013 for ground and flight display. The single-seat e-spider is nearing completion for initial production runs after undergoing extensive development and flight testing during the past year. Daily flying demos of the e-spider are planned during AirVenture at the ultralight area runway. NASA has made history once again, as a NASA Advanced Ion Propulsion Engine has successfully operated for more than 48,000 hours, or five and a half years, making it the longest test duration of any type of space propulsion system demonstration project ever. The thruster was developed under NASA's evolutionary Xenon Thruster Project at NASA's Glenn Research Center in Cleveland. The next engine is a type of solar electric propulsion in which thruster systems use the electricity generated by the spacecraft's solar panel to accelerate the xenon propellant to speeds of up to 90,000 miles per hour. This provides a dramatic improvement in performance compared to conventional chemical rocket engines. The 7 kilowatt class thruster could be used in a wide variety of science missions, including deep space missions identified in NASA's Planetary Science Decadal Survey. In a unanimous vote that surprised no one last week, Anthony Fox was confirmed as the new Secretary of Transportation. Tom Patton has that story. The vote was not unexpected as Fox had sailed through hearings in the U.S. Senate. Senate Commerce Committee Chairman John D. J. Rockefeller, a Democrat from West Virginia who presided over those hearings, congratulated Mayor Fox on his confirmation following the vote. Rockefeller said he looks forward to working with Fox, adding that he hopes Fox will be, quote, the broker we need to break the partisan gridlock so we can make critical investments that will preserve and strengthen our nation's infrastructure. Gamma, the General Aviation Manufacturers Association, issued a similar statement of support while reminding the new secretary of the role GA plays in the nation's economy. The Gamma statement said that as the former mayor of Charlotte, North Carolina, Mr. Fox saw firsthand the importance of general aviation to that city's economy. Gamma urged Fox to adopt policies that encourage the success and growth of general aviation nationwide. Both the NBAA and NADA also issued statements welcoming Fox to his new position and expressing their willingness to work with the new secretary on a number of issues. For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. Plans to replace Canada's aging fleet of Sea Kings has suffered another setback recently, as Canada's Public Works Minister Rona Ambrose has hired an outside consultant to evaluate Sikorsky's ability to deliver new helicopters to the Canadian Defence Department. 
Sikorsky won a contract to provide 28 CH-148 Cyclone helicopters to Canada in 2004 to replace the country's 50-year-old Sea King helos. The contract is reportedly worth $1.8 billion to Sikorsky and includes a 20-year maintenance and support clause worth $3.2 billion. But the Canadian Broadcasting Company recently raised new questions about the contract, prompting the hiring of the consultant who has not been publicly named by Ambrose. The Canadian government first looked at replacing the Sea Kings back in 1992. In cooperation with the FAA, the Aircraft Electronics Association played host to more than 50 attendees at last week's AML STC Avionics Production Certification Workshop, which took place June 25th through the 26th at the AEA's International Headquarters in Lee Summit, Missouri. The workshop was a first step in addressing the challenges of certifying new systems using the AML STC criteria. Attendees discussed a variety of issues, including breaking the cost barriers to avionics certification, validation procedures for approved model lists under the bilateral aviation safety agreements between the U.S. and Europe, as well as Canada, what role production approval plays in the cost equation, and how Part 21 production can be scaled for general aviation retrofit, and more. Additional workshops are planned to continue seeking solutions for streamlined and cost-effective certifications. You're watching Airborne. More in a moment. Since its inception, Redbird Flight Simulations has been dedicated to developing new training technologies and processes in an ongoing effort to make aviation safer, more affordable, and more accessible. Consider Redbird's flagship flight training device, the FMX, a superior quality, full motion, feature rich advanced aviation training device priced with real world flight training organizations in mind. With standard features that are anything but standard such as wraparound visuals, a fully enclosed cockpit, quick change configurations, scenario based training compatibility and of course an electric motion platform, the FMX serves up a level of realism that is simply unavailable in other training devices on the market. For more information on Redbird Flight Simulations, the Redbird FMX, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne, Aero TV, our website, or podcast, drop us an email to news by at aero news.net. JetBlue is the latest airline to move to an electronic flight bag based on the Apple iPad. Following a successful trial phase with approximately 60 pilots over several months, the FAA has approved and JetBlue has begun giving all 2,500 pilots a fourth generation 16 gigabyte Wi-Fi capable Apple iPad. While JetBlue has been approved for a decade to use a PC-based laptop in the cockpit called an electronic flight bag, the iPads will offer new capabilities and conveniences, especially as JetBlue implements Comband Satellite Wi-Fi. Jeff Martin, Senior Vice President of Operations for JetBlue, said, quote, The iPads will have real-time weather capability and the ability to update safety and flight documents securely. We expect to add digital chart capability once it is approved, end quote. With JetBlue's coming CAW-based satellite capability enabled by live TV, pilots will be able to download weather imagery in seconds. JetBlue will implement iPad use during the next three months to ensure a safe transition. German police have taken two men into custody and searched buildings at several addresses in multiple cities, thwarting what they say was a plan to use remote-controlled airplanes to carry out terrorist attacks. Among the materials seized were technical information and other paperwork that indicated there was a homegrown attack in the planning stages. German authorities said that during the Tuesday morning raid, police confiscated multiple model aircraft, some reportedly large enough to carry sufficient explosives to destroy a commercial building. If you're a fan of model airplanes and or live in Indiana, you want to circle August 17th in red on your calendar. Why? Indiana Governor Mike Pence 
has declared August 17th, 2013 as Model Aviation Day. National Model Aviation Day has been established by the Academy of Model Aeronautics, the country's foremost organization for model aviation, to celebrate the history of model aviation and to promote the hobby on a national scale. The Academy will celebrate Indiana Model Aviation Day at its national headquarters in Muncie, Indiana, along with AMA chartered clubs across the country. A total of 132 AMA chartered clubs have registered to participate and to host local events, and dozens more are expected to sign up before the August 1st deadline. Each of the participating clubs will promote model aviation and the many benefits of participating in the hobby. This nationwide event will also serve as a fundraiser to benefit the Wounded Warrior Project. Piper Aircraft and Red Bull team at Chambliss are combining forces at this year's EAA Air Venture. Piper will display Team Chambliss's company transport support airplane, a Piper Meridian, along with Kirby Chambliss's Aerobatic Edge 540, one of the flight attractions at Oshkosh. Kirby Chambliss uses the Piper Meridian for business transportation as he travels to and from Red Bull exhibitions in his aerobatic aircraft. The chief pilot and team owner flies the Meridian about 200 to 250 hours annually, and he says he appreciates the pressurization, fuel economy, speed, and altitude capabilities of the M-Class Piper turboprop. In addition, Chambliss, a two-time Red Bull Air Race world champion, will be on hand Wednesday and Friday to sign autographs and talk to fans at the Piper exhibit. And now it's time for our Aero Video of the Week. Flying aerobatics is one thing, towing a glider is another, but doing both at the same time, with the glider mirroring the tow plane's maneuvers? Check it out on today's ABW. Search YouTube for extra towing glider doing arrows. Finally, today on Airborne, three men cut through a locked door to get through the roof of Chicago's Trump International Hotel and Tower only to then parachute back to the street, 1,170 feet below. So far, the three illegal base jumpers have eluded police, despite clear photos of the men as they climbed the stairs to the top of the building. The jump reportedly occurred around midnight. By the time hotel security alerted local police to the intrusion, the three were off the roof, on the ground, and blended back into the city. One resident of the building told ABC News that he does not know how the trio accessed the roof. He said that he has an electronic key that only allows him to access his floor of the tower and that it's like Fork Knox getting to the 91st floor. It's not the first time base jumpers have taken a leap from the building either. Authorized professional jumpers did so in 2010 during the filming of Transformers 3. A year later, a British man made an unauthorized jump from a high-rise under construction across the river from the Trump Tower. He landed in front of a police officer and was immediately arrested. Well, that's our program for July 2nd. Remember, you can get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories at aero-news.net. And since this Thursday is the 4th of July, we will not be having an episode of Airborne on Friday, so you'll have to tune in next Tuesday for a new episode. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.